Okay. All righty, Juliana, you want to start us off? Ah, uh, yes. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the IACS Student Seminar. It's my pleasure as uh, Bill Thomas's advisor to introduce him today. Bill Thomas came to us from Woods Hole Marine um, Biology Laboratory and where he had been previously working on Xenopus and on development using the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So he came with uh, some skills that were um, really new to the lab. And he was immediately interested and very taken with phenotypic plasticity, which is having the same genotype by actually ending up with different phenotypes. Well, that's the textbook definition of plasticity. So in designing his dissertation, he came up with a series of, um, a series of experiments that he'll be talking about that are part of our Human Frontiers of Science uh, uh, funded grant. And it's a, it's a really exciting opportunity to work in a non-model organism and to, uh, and to show what we have been doing in that field. Uh, he has been making excellent progress, as you'll see, and he will introduce some of this new data today. So I welcome you. Here's Bill Thomas. Hi, everyone. Let me share my screen. Okay, can everybody see the presentation? No, we're, we're seeing the presenter view. Perfect. All right, let me... There's a flip, there's a little... No, well, okay. Hold on. Um, yeah, swap. Swap displays, there you go. Better? Yep. Okay. That's good. Let me... Okay. So hi, everybody, and thanks for coming to my presentation, um, using evolutionary models to understand the genetic mechanisms of unique wintering strategy. And of course, my keyboard isn't going to work now. OK, so a few years ago, I traveled to Costa Rica. And when I was there, I saw a variety of different organisms. And the one thing that was really apparent there compared to here is these these adaptations that all the organisms have there to survive their normal day-to-day -day lives uh, living in a tropical rainforest. And so some of these adaptations help an organism survive and some of them uh, deal with defense. And so in the upper left-hand corner right here, you can see a baby porcupine that has quills that help protect it, or in the upper right, the poison in a strawberry poison dart frog um, that help defend it. Um, other adaptations um, can be sexual in nature, so like the male quetzal in the lower left, that's coloration and long tail help it attract a mate. And all of this is to try and help the organism pass on its uh, genetic code or DNA to the next generation. And so I find this all very interesting because all of these organisms have came from the same common ancestors. So that natural selection has caused these lineages to diverge so much in their adaptations, their body structures, um, all from a similar genetic code way back when. And from a molecular standpoint, this is also still really interesting because many of these organisms still have uh, the same grab bag of genes for their adaptations to occur from. And so this is why one of the overarching goals of evolutionary biology is to understand how natural selection and its forces can influence the genome to just create this diversity of adaptations. And so to introduce the study species of interest um, that I'm working on, it's the European common shrew, Sorx rodents. And so this is a relatively small insectivore that's widely distributed across the Western Palearctic. Um, it's been described as a habitat generalist, so it'll live in forests, grasslands, and um, even gardens. And it also has a relatively short lifespan of about a year. So juveniles are born in the late spring, early summer. Uh, they reach sexual maturity a little under a year later, have a handful of litters, and then um, typically die prior to their um, second winter. And so this is really important because there's non-overlapping generations, and it's going to be important for some of the analyses I show because essentially you can pick up a shrew and just based on the time of year it is, you know exactly where it is in its development, 
because you're not going to grab another shrew from a different generation. Um, so I saw, well, I guess I didn't see too many, but it's kind of confusing, right? Because I have talked about these cool traits that I'm really interested in. And I show you trips to Costa Rica. And then I show you this shrew that kind of just looks like something you just would normally find in your backyard um, and not very interesting. But it's actually really interesting. And I'm going to try and spend this entire presentation convincing you that shrews are interesting. And so I first want to start with shrews extremely high metabolism. Um, and so if you look um, right here from one of Jan Taylor's papers, um, you can see this allometry of body mass on the x-axis um, to metabolic rate on the y-axis. And you can see that as organisms tend to grow, or at least mammals, um, the metabolic rate increases um, allometrically um, for metabolic rate and body mass. And so if you look at this line, it's the typical trend that's found in mammals, but all of the shrewd data points, or almost all of them, are above this line. And if you look at the um, genus we're working with, Sorex, these are these high circles with just extremely high metabolic rates. And so this is something we actually see while working with the shrews. Um, when we trap the shrews, um, you actually need to check the traps every two hours because the shrews just need to constantly be eating or they'll starve to death. Um, and you can also see this when we try and anesthetize them, we can barely get them to go to sleep um, just because this, this metabolism is really just functioning um, at a high rate in them. And it's just something to think about throughout this entire presentation because shrews just have this limited energy inertia. And this can be really problematic in the winter, right? So in the winter, you have temperature decreases and you have general ecosystem productivity decreases. And so organisms, especially mammals, which are homeothermic, are spending a lot more energy maintaining their internal temperature at a time when the ecosystem isn't typically providing them with very much nutrition or energy. And so there's a handful of wintering strategies that um, a lot of mammals use, and one of them is just being um, migration. So some bats will um, migrate south um, for the winter and other species um, to head to an area where productivity is higher and then migrate back up north but this is difficult for shrews because they just have such a limited home range of about one kilometer. They're not gonna make it too far to try and um, find a place that has better productivity. Um, a second adaptation is hibernation where organisms uh, pack on fat and store lipids um, in the summer and in the late fall. And then they will enter a state of torpor, reducing their metabolic rate and uh, metabolizing this fat throughout the um, throughout the winter, but again, shrews can't really do this because they struggle so much to put on fat. And um, just due to this high metabolic rate, again, they can't enter torpor, or at least this species can't enter torpor. And then um, some organisms simply just get bigger. They put on a boundary layer um, and they increase their volume. And you see this lower surface area to volume, volume ratio, so they don't have as much heat loss. But again, shrews, small and they really don't follow this trend. And so this brings me to this really unique wintering adaptation that shrews do called Denhell's Phenomenon. And so Denhell's Phenomenon is this seasonal and reversible size change in the body mass, organ mass, and um, brain size in shrews. And so if you look at this graph that I adapted from a paper in 1970, if you look at the red line for body mass, you'll see that shr shrews shrink um, in the fall, reaching a minimum during the winter and then rapid regrowth in the spring. And so this occurs throughout many different organs, but um, if you notice in yellow, it also occurs slightly in the brain. Um, and so this is really interesting that the brain is able to shrink during the winter because the brain is one of like the functionally most important organs in the body. It really has its hands in almost every bodily process from movement to sensing to memory to homeostasis. It, it, really, it really does it all. And so for the brain to shrink, likely reducing its capabilities, it has to be for an important reason. So the, the adaptation of going through this seasonal shrinkage must be very important for the shrew and for its fitness. And so the current hypothesis on why this is happening 
is that shrews are reducing the amount of energy devoted towards maintaining these larger tissues, these larger organs, and reducing the amount of fat turnover that is occurring for um, these organs in an attempt to save energy. And so here is just a really simplistic diagram on how phenotypes occur. And so you start with the coding DNA and the coding DNA is then translated into RNA. RNA is transcribed into protein. Um, these proteins typically interact in these very large and complex pathways that are filled with feedback loops, positive, negative feedback. Um, and so it's just this complex pathway that ends up generating traits. And then traits are what organisms use to pass their DNA to the next generation. So there's this continued process of essentially this is evolution. And the forces of evolution or lack of forces tend to generally act in this area. They act everywhere, but just for simplicity, this is generally where they act. And you can have natural selection that acts on a phenotype. And so this is the process where beneficial mutations are passed along to the next generation at a higher rate than expected or negative or um, deleterious mutations are selected against being passed to the next generation. Or you can have a random process like genetic drift where mutations are just random. There's no selective forces again. It's, so it's just a random occurrence that they're propagated to the next generation because selection actually isn't acting on them. And so using this framework, I'm gonna kind of ask, uh, how has this trait evolved and is it due to natural selection? And what are the underlying molecular mechanisms of Denhell's phenomena? And so I'm first gonna start by just characterizing the trait and hoping that that kind of gives us some sort of inference of, is this natural selection or is this just some sort of randomness in its development? And so the first question I ask is, Denhell's phenomenon caused by an environmental cue? And so you can kind of feel like if there's an environmental cue that's causing this plasticity, that it's likely adaptive. Think about how when you go, um, when your skin gets a tan, it's your skin essentially changing its pigment to block out radiation from the sun. And so it's, an, it's signaled by the sun radiation. And so if we can find this for Denhouse phenomenon, we can maybe think that it's adaptive. And so what we're going to do for this is use brain case height as a proxy for Denhell's phenomenon. So if you remember from my graph about two slides ago, essentially the brain case height moves in a similar manner um, to the trends found for body size, for brain mass, things like that. And so we're gonna use it as a proxy. And by doing so, we can take X-ray images of the shrew across Denhell's phenomenon. We can alter the temperatures um, that the shrews are experiencing to see if uh, temperature is the environmental crew, uh, environmental cue. And then um, we are able to see if this is a plastic response to um, temperature. And so we kept the shrews at just a constant temperature as shown in, in gray, uh, at ambient temperature as shown in light blue, and then allowed the shrews to free range um, in outdoor exposures in yellow. And as you can see, any shrew that experienced what the uh, shrews would naturally find outdoors temperature wise underwent Denhell's phenomenon. And so the cue is likely temperature. And as it's an environmental factor, it's suggesting that this phenotype is indeed an adaptive phenotype, trying to combat the temperature um, or the productivity of the ecosystem that's associated with temperature um, during the winter. So adaptive, we're thinking it's definitely adaptive and not just a developmental, de developmental thing. And so we characterize the phenotype a little bit more. Um, and so we took MRI images of the shrew throughout all of the stages, and then measure the volume using the 2D atlas we created in the upper left to see if these the shrinkage and regrowth is occurring um, in different brain regions. And so you can see on the right that it's occurring in the hippocampus and thalamus. Um, and it's also actually occurring in a variety of other different regions too, just not shown here, such as the cortex, uh, the hypothalamus and the olfactory bone. And so just by looking at the trait, we now can kind of realize that, yes, this does seem like it's a naturally selected for adaptation just based on the environmental cues and that changes are happening in individual brain regions. It's not just the cortex shrinking. Um, and so now from here, we can start to look at what the underlying molecular mechanisms might be. And so to start, I'm gonna hone in on the DNA um, and try and see if this gives us any sort of inference on what the um, 
what's happening genetically speaking. And so to do this, I'm gonna do comparative genomics. And so what is comparative genomics? It's kind of, you can kind of get it just based on its name, but essentially it's a field of research where the genome sequences of a clade of choice, in our case, mammals are compared. And when you can compare that, when you compare these genomes, you can start to do things like a phylogenetic reconstruction. And that way you can better understand the relationships between the organisms at hand. And then from here, you can hone in on a particular lineage of interest. In our case, it's shrews because we're trying to figure out what's happening with Denhouse phenomenon. You can find a conserved region between the genomes. Um, so in our cases, I'm typically going to be looking at genes that are highly conserved amongst mammals. And then you can try and find differences or mutations that are occurring in these genomes. And so what are these changes that we're looking for? And so here I have an alignment of APOC2 between five mammal species. And if you look in white, you can see the DNA or the coding sequence. And above it, you see the protein sequence that it codes for. And so you can look at um, loci um, in these genomes that have a change in site or mutation. And there are different types of these mutations. So you have synonymous mutations as shown by DS on the right. And these are essentially mutations in the genome um, between the different lineages where the nucleotide has no effect on the amino acid. And so here you see that there is a transition from a C to a T, but the resulting amino acid is aspartic acid. You can compare these to non-synonymous non mutations or DN, which when there is a change at this site, it actually does have an effect on the amino acid. And so if you look at the ratio of these DNs to DSs, it's an omega ratio. And essentially if it's lower than one, you can assume that purifying selection is occurring. Essentially that um, natural selection is removing the mutations that affect the resulting protein structure purposefully because they're deleterious. And it, so you expect a low numerator, and essentially something less than one versus say, let's say positive selection where you find more of these non-synonymous mutations than synonymous and um, a value greater than one. And so you can map these back onto the phylogeny. And in theory, you would hope to find that your organism in a particular gene has a higher DNDS ratio over one and none of the organisms do. But unfortunately, this isn't the reality because the reason why you're able to find these conserved regions or genes is that purifying selection is conserving them because they are important to an organism's function and you don't want to essentially temper with it too much. And so you can't exactly do that, but you can run models such as these branch site models to help you get towards your answer. And essentially, instead of looking at a full gene, you narrow it down to these sites. And what you're going to do is you're going to take your particular lineage of interest, in our case, again, the shrews, and you're going to model it under a null expectation at all these sites where you do not let the DN, DS ratio or omega go higher than one, where positive selection would be occurring. And so you model your observed data against this null model and get a likelihood. And then you're gonna run it against an alternative model where you do let positive selection occur, where you do let the DN, DS ratio go higher than one on the true lineage. And you take a look at all the sites throughout it, you take your likelihood, and then you compare your likelihoods of each one of these models and do a likelihood ratio test. And so this is essentially what I did um, for shrew, and I compared it against 47 other mammal species and did this for 10,000 genes that are shared amongst all of these species. And so when I did this, I found 591 positively selected genes. And so here I've highlighted just a handful of them that I think could be associated with Denhouse phenomenon. And so one of them right here is GRIN 2A, which is involved in synaptic plasticity. Um, as it's involved in the long-term potentiation to increase the efficiency of synaptic transmission uh, that helps with underlying memory and learning. And so I don't necessarily think that this is a driver of Denhouse phenomenon, but I think it could be associated with Denhouse phenomenon, phenomenon in the sense that as the brain shrinks um, during um, the winter or the fall and winter, that these um, ion channels that influence synaptic plasticity could really be beneficial for improving things like memory and learning at a time when the brain capabilities might be reduced. 
There are other genes like these APOC genes that are involved with lipid metabolism that essentially provide the free um, fatty acids for cells. And so rather than just being something that might help the phenotype during um, the winter, it might be at the actual molecular mechanism that is creating shrinkage and regrowth. Um, but this is the part of my results that my advisor Liliana sometimes likes to call alphabet soup. And she calls it alphabet soup because now I have 591 genes that might be associated with Denhel's phenomenon. And unfortunately, I don't know what every single gene does, what they do in the shrews, and how they're necessarily correlated with each other. And so what you do here now, or what I've done, is a pathway enrichment analysis. And essentially, it's a way of reducing dimensionality. So instead of having 591 genes and not really knowing what's happening, I can bin them all into their associated pathways. So you can see that I've reduced the dimensionality uh, just by looking at their associations and then seeing if any of these pathways are over enriched for genes I found in my result. And so it's a really good way of kind of zooming out on your results, finding these pathways that you think might be interesting and in whether or not they have some sort of enrichment and then zooming back in on the genes um, that you found. And so when I did this pathway enrichment analysis, uh, as you can see here, my second most enriched pathway was the etherolipid metabolism pathway, which is phospholipid metabolism. Um, and so we definitely think that this is some sort of player in Denhel's phenomenon. And so just by looking at the DNA sequence, we've essentially found 591 genes that can be candidate genes um, for future analyses, such as APOC2, GRIN2A, or UCP1. And we think that lipid metabolism might play some sort of role in this too. And so next we can kind of try and confirm this a little bit by looking at the RNA. And so what I'm, some of the experiments I did with RNA was comparative transcriptomics. And so let's just talk about um, like doing a comparative trait. And so you can take any sort of trait that's evolved in evolution. So here, uh, brain size. And you can look at the general relationship between the org organisms and try and figure out which traits are evolving at a different rate than expected. And so here we're like, all right, which one of these brain sizes might be different uh, based on expected neutral uh, evolution? And so what you're essentially going to have to do is compare it to a null model. And so on the left, we have Brownian motion, which is uh, the null model for evolution. And essentially, if you look in the lower left, you can see that a trait over time is really just based on the rate of change or so the steps that it's going to take between generations or between speciation events. And it's just going to be based on a random stochastic process. So here, the Wiener process, and it's just going to go up and down, up and down, essentially randomly. It's a random walk. And you can compare that to an alternate hypothesis, such as the ornstein almbeck hypothesis. And so the ornstein almbeck or an OU model, has essentially this rubber band parameter that is trying to bring the trait back to an optimum. And so it's making an assumption that traits have some sort of general optimum. You have to think if you're talking body size, that essentially you aren't going to get a Godzilla or King Kong of body size. It's going to be heading towards this optimum. And essentially, the further that you get away from the optimum, so that optimum difference I'm showing in red, there's some sort of multiplicative effect or rubber band parameter that snaps it back to the optimum based on how far away you've gotten. And so what you can do is you can um, model this under an OU process. You can do simulations to see what it is expected and compare it to what you observed and then find the trait of interest. So here you would find that humans and whales have a larger brain than expected based on their local optimums, and that bats actually have a smaller brain. And so what I do with this, with my RNA, is that I treat the brain region expression as a quantitative trait, as you would for something like brain size across all of the genes, and I model this under the OU expectations. And so what I do is I test um, 7,000 orthologous genes between 12 different lineages where I was able to find publicly available uh, hippocampus expression um, RNA expression from the phylogeny and model it onto the phylogeny shown on the left. And so when I do this, just to show one example of star D10, you can see that why I actually modeled this with OU expectations. A lot of the expression profiles actually hover around in this blue range of being quite ubiquitous across mammals. 
but some of the lineages are up expressed and some of the lineages are down expressed. So up expression shown in green and down expression shown in red. And so it looks like star D um, 10, although maybe not as much as some of the other species is up expressed um, in the shrew lineage compared to uh, the local optimum you see on that branch up there. And so when I did this, I found 247 um, genes that are, had this lineage expression shift. And when I compare it back to my genomics data set, these ones that are evolving under positive selection, I actually fi only find 11 that are, um, that are in each data set. And so this isn't incredibly shocking of a result because when you change the amino acid or the protein structure, um, through positive selection, you are likely changing the function of the protein and not necessarily the regulation of the protein. So the regulation has a lot to do with promoters upstream or things like transcription factors binding to it. Um, so it's not crazy that there's such little overlap. Eventually evolution will catch up if the function changes and probably start to switch around the regulation of it. But because there was this overlap, maybe there's a change in both function and regulation. And so I think it's interesting that five out of the 11 overlapped genes actually have to do with um, sensing based on hearing and on vision. And so shrews actually use olfaction and smell as their main source of sensing. And so it's conceivable to see that this set of genes has evolved due to positive selection because it's no longer constrained by the shrew's use of it and now has a new function in the brain. And so these are an interesting uh, set of genes to look at, um, but also um, there's interesting genes that's just, just in the transcriptomics data set. And so to highlight two of these, one of them is FOXA, which is a transcription factor that deals in the regulation of fat metabolism. And transcription factors are really important because essentially they can create a cascade of different effects within um, your expression profiles. And that's because they bind to so many genes and regulate so many genes that you can just, yeah, you see these cascades. And so it's really interesting that FOXA2 um, uh, transcription factor for fat metabolism is in this data set, but it's also interesting that we have KLF2, which inhibits PPAR gamma. And PPAR gamma is a transcription factor. So not only do you have a transcription factor, you have something that is inhibiting a transcription factor and essentially prevents the production of fat cells. And so I think these are two really interesting candidates to look at in future analyses. And I think it, that it might actually be involved in Den Hell's phenomenon. But moving on, I also did this for the hypothalamus. And for this, there are actually more public, publicly available um, data sets for. So now I have 17 other mammal species in a slightly condensed uh, gene set uh, with 6,000 orthologous genes. And so again, for the hypothalamus, we see a change in star D6, so not star D10, but star D6. And you can see that shrews actually have a downshift in the expression of this gene. And so that's kind of interesting because um, most mammals have this ubiquitously expressed, at least at some point, and shrews are one of the few species that don't. And so you have to question, why are shrews not expressing this in their brain when almost every other organism is? But going just beyond that example, we have um, a few others like BEST3, which is actually found in all three of our data sets. And BEST3 is involved in pa pancreatic duct uh, transmembrane proteins. And so it's interesting that this organism that produces a lot of um, proteins for the body and in digestion is now being heavily expressed um, in the brain um, compared to other lineages. And then you also get a handful of other genes like FFAR4 or STAR-D6 that are involved in adipogenesis. And so I took this 247 genes and I again threw it into a pathway analysis. And when I did this, I almost got a significant result. Definitely not significant though. Uh, but the most enriched pathway was metabolic pathways. And there was 21 genes that were found in this. And the reason why it's likely not significant is because this isn't like lipid metabolism pathway. This is just a metabolic pathway, which essentially means they combined we combined all of the um, metabolism pathways into one large pathway. And so that, that gene list is huge. And so 21 genes is a lot, but compared to how many genes are in that gene list, it's not that, that much. But 
being the most enriched pathway, it does again suggest that something in the brain, metabolically speaking, is very important. And so now just by looking at the RNA, we start to get a handful of different genes that we think might be interesting still, like BES3, the FFAR4, or STAR-D. And I'm underlying metabolism because even if it's not lipid metabolism, even though we still think it is, it's definitely something metabolic happening in the brain that's helping cause this um, seasonal reversible size change. And so I'm going to take you on one more RNA story that I've done to try and again, get at these underlying molecular mechanisms. And so instead of comparing the RNA expression profiles um, between species, I'm actually going to compare it within species across different stages. And so I am sequencing the RNA of all of these organs from five different stages during Denhouse phenomenon and looking at the changes of genes between stages. And so you assume that if there was no change that it likely has almost nothing to do with Denhouse phenomenon, it's just ubiquitously expressed RNA, but you might find these patterns of transiently downregulated or transiently upregulated uh, genes. And these might be involved in both shrinkage and regrowth, or you might just see some sort of downregulation and upregulation at certain points that you can somehow correlate to um, shrinkage or regrowth. And so the methods that I did for this is that um, I sequenced the RNA of many different organs, but I also sequenced the RNA of five different brain regions that we found to be shrinking from the morphometric analysis. Um, but today I'm just going to be showing you uh, between two different stages. Um, and I think I'm just going to be showing you between the hypothalamus and the thalamus, even though I'm still showing five brain regions here. And just the briefest of how these methods occur. Essentially, you sequence the RNA, you get raw reads, you filter out any reads that are poor in quality. You go through this AQN process where you essentially align all of your reads back to the genome. You quantify how many times the reads um, are mapped to the genome, and then you normalize across samples. And essentially, this will get you a count matrix of each gene's count uh, for each individual tissue, and then you can compare this between stages and do a differential expression analysis. And so just plotting some of these counts onto and conducting a PCA, you can see the two-stage gene expression PCA. And for here, you can see that color shows stage while region is shape. And the reason why I'm showing you this, especially with the stages in color, is that there's some sort of difference between stage one and stage two, um, even between uh, different organs, that it's separating themselves uh, based on the PC, uh, Principal, principal component one. And so using these differences, we can conduct the differential gene expression analysis. And so right here, I'm showing you some Manhattan plots where you can see counts on the x-axis versus the log fold change between stages on the y-axis. And so all the blue points are ones that had p genes that had p-values of less than 0 0.05. And you can see how the model tends to um, have a lower proportion of significant genes for genes that are lowly expressed as it's trying to really only get genes that are more highly expressed so that way you can um, quantify it better. And so from here, you can hone in on a different region such as the hippocampus and start to pick out some of these genes of interest that I've shown you earlier. And so here you can see some of these um, synaptic plasticity genes that I had mentioned from my positive selection analysis, such as CAM2, CAMK2B and GRIN2A. And you can see that in the summer, they're pretty lowly expressed, but there's this higher expression that's occurring during the fall. And that's interesting because fall is the time of shrinkage, right? But you're actually seeing um, these genes being upregulated. And so the current, my current hypothesis at least is that this is some sort of way to combat shrinkage. So even if you are reducing the amount of maybe fat in the genes or, or fat in the brain, or neurons in the brain, that you're at least improving the capability of what is left through these synaptic, synaptic plasticity genes. But you can also look at the hypothalamus data and see how these APOC1 genes are being lowly expressed in the fall compared to being highly expressed in the summer. And this again might be some sort of, some part of the molecular mechanism that's happening where because shrinkage is happening in the fall, that they're providing less of these free fatty acids for the brain to use um, 
in the fall, and it might be what's contributing to shrinkage. And so I've done this with a handful of different tissues. I'm not going to show you every single gene that I think is interesting, but essentially what we get from this data set is, again, another list of more genes that we think might be part of the molecular mechanism. So these APOCs, which help corroborate what we find from the positive selection, RIN2A and CAMP2KB. And then, so we're going to skip the proteins. Um, it's something that some of our collaborators are working on, but you always hope that the proteins um, are correlated well with the RNA expression. Uh, we're we're going to skip it for right now and just head straight to a pathway analysis. And so essentially, we're going to look at gene regulatory networks. And so I kind of described this earlier, but gene regulatory networks are these very complex networks of how your proteins and genes are essentially interacting with each other. And you can see that in the center of a network, you have some genes that um, are highly correlated and appear to function with many other different genes um, and helps regulate these genes versus maybe edge proteins or genes where it's a little bit more sparse out there and some genes just have a limited effect on others or might just be lightly correlated. So you can start to build some of these gene regulatory networks just based on the correlation that you find in your RNA data. And so what I'm gonna be honing in on, I realize this probably isn't the most helpful figure because it's kind of small. I'm gonna be honing in on this PPAR signaling pathway. And essentially why I'm honing in on this is that this pathway deals with lipid metabolism, with fat cell differentiation, or thermogenesis. So even again, right here is UCP1, which is one of the genes I pulled out from the positive selection analysis. And I essentially want to see if the gene regulatory network or this pathway, this PPAR pathway, differs between stage one and stage two, my summer and my fall individuals. And so essentially what I did is I created these gene networks um, for stage one and stage two and looked at the correlation amongst nodes or the different genes that are in them. And so you can see um, that the red lines between the nodes are negative correlations, while the green lines are positive correlations but it kind of looks like I just made like a random network. Like how do, you, how do you grab information from this highly complex situation? And so what I did was I created a differential network analysis. And so essentially what you do is you plot the correlation of your network one and your correlation between, your correlations found in network two between nodes and you're gonna bin them. And so if the correlation is positive in the first network and positive in your second network, it gets binned in this alpha. Uh, alpha tile, which is it's present in all the networks with the same sign and links weight. Um, you can look at um, correlations that are opposite or different, these betas, where it's a positive correlation found in one network, but a negative correlation in the other network. And so this is where two different genes are now completely uh, switched their signs on correlation. So a gene is no longer maybe activating another gene or in that particular pathway. Or you can just look at um, um, stage specific um, correlations where you find a correlation in one of the stage. So like right here, you'd see a negative correlation with no correlation found in network one. And this is interesting. You can branch this out to do multiple networks or three networks. And it becomes really interested if you have a specific, um, a specific correlation in one network, but none of the others, but it's not as interesting for um, just comparing two networks. And so from this, you can do a different, you can make a differential network where you see the coloring is going to be a little bit off, you're going to see, but you can see uh, the green correlates, which are the alphas that are shared between networks. You can find the stage specific um, correlates. So stage one and stage two in blue. And then what we're really interested in is which of these nodes are now expressing more negative links than um, positive links. And so here you see ASCL4 and PPARA alpha. And I know PPARA is in blue, but it's colored right now, not based on the weighted um, parameters. So if you if you weight it based on where it lies in those boxes I showed you, it actually is a, a beta link. It has 15 beta links um, between different nodes and um, 17 gamma links. And so PPAR alpha is actually one of these transcription factors. Um, and so now if you look at these links that it has um, to many different other genes, all of them obviously aren't shown here, but 15 of them are now negative correlations from stage two to stage one. And that's really interesting. What's, what's causing these correlations to shift so drastically? 
is it potentially some sort of upstream in inhibitor like uh, CPT1 alpha? Or um, I know this isn't PPA or gamma, but it could be a KLF2, some sort of crupal like factor. And so this is really interesting, right? This gene that drives so many other genes is now has this negative correlation. And so that's something we really want to look at in the future. And so just kind of summing up, um, we really think this PPAI pathway is really important in Denhel's phenomenon, that as you look at the changes in the brain regions and the genes that are changing due to positive selection or the RNA sequences that are evolving in a different manner than expected, it all seems to eventually point towards this lipid metabolism to this PPAR pathway. And so actually what we're doing next, and I'm not going to show it here, is we're trying to inhibit this pathway using um, uh, a known inhibitor called CPT1-alpha and feeding this drug to the shrews in hopes that it'll block Denhel's phenomenon. And so that's going to be our final test on whether or not this is the functionally important pathway um, that's underlying this really cool trait. And so that's generally all I have. Um, I just want to thank um, a, ton of, a ton of our collaborators, obviously Liliana, my advisor. Um, we have our Denmark team, um, our Danish team that is doing a lot of the proteomics that I didn't present here today, and our German team that has sent all of these samples over to us, done all of the collections. And so probably I said we 50 times in this presentation. And so when I said we, it really is um, a we. <laughs> um, and the Human Frontier Science Program for funding this. And then just like, I, I think I have a few more minutes. Um, just as a future goals, I know I showed how I really want to look at how genes change throughout this entire cycle. And so one of the methods I plan on using for this is this clustering analysis, where essentially you take each gene, you give it a z-score, um, just based on the mean and the standard deviation, and you follow it across the different stages, and then you do some sort of machine learning clustering analysis where it bins these genes uh, just based on the graph you provide it into these clusters of, let's say, upregulated, downregulated, transiently downregulated. And so you can find the genes that are in these clusters and say, oh, this is interesting that um, the lipid metabolism genes are all being transiently downregulated during the fall and then upregulated in the spring. And so this is one of my plans for when I finally get that data in. Um, but obviously this is an IACS seminar. And so if anybody has sort of an interest or an idea in this, feel free to email me. Uh, my email's right down there. And yeah, now I'm really done, like super done. Um, but yeah, so any questions, comments, or concerns, I will gladly take. Could I ask a question about your genomic analysis? Yeah. So you mentioned that since your genomic analysis is on the protein coding sequence, mm -hmm. it's probably not going to get at the expression effects. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, is it possible to do the analysis on the upstream? Yeah. Yeah. So it's something um, I haven't gotten to work just yet. But essentially, right, I talked about how you can find conserved regions just like you can find the genes. And so there's actually methods where you can find conserved promoters, right? Promoters, since they do deal with regulation, they do, um, they are more conserved than just non-coding random um, elements. And so I've been able to hone in on those specific regions. And essentially, instead of looking at um, your DNDS values that affect protein structure, you can just look at the rate of evolution. How many mutations do you see? Do you see some sort of increase in the amount of mutations between lineages? And so I haven't finished those results yet. And that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I'm hoping that I can start to try and correlate some of these um, upstream non-coding elements with the genes that are found nearby. And yeah, looking at the rate of evolution. Um, so yeah, you can do it. I'm trying to do it, um, but yeah, it's a little bit more difficult um, because they're, they are less conserved. Thank you. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. 
So in your trans transcriptome data, have you tried to compare it to like a uh, pre-puberty state? I guess my question is when the brain shrinks, does this mimicking the pre-puberty smaller brain or it just shrinks overall? Um, so are you talking about when I compare it between species or when I'm comparing amongst stages? Stages. So when I'm comparing between the stages, um, it's, it, they're, they're all pre-puberty um, currently. So the, the shrews don't hit puberty until about their first year. Um, so the next spring. So currently I was just doing the summer to fall, which are both pre-pubescent. -pub, pre but yeah, that's a great question because once puberty hits, tons of different things are going to be happening. And so when I get the full data set, um, that, that spring, that first time in spring is when I'm going to be able to actually compare to the um, pubescent brain. Um, and I, I do realize that there's going to be some correlates with, um, yeah, what you find um, happening in the brain during puberty. But no, I haven't done that yet. source of uh, one source of evidence bill is also the morphology so the morphology the the shrinkage and the regrowth are not mirror of one another so morphologically they are allometrically different which suggests yeah. different processes going on yeah yeah michael Maybe you're muted or maybe I just see a hand. Michael, you have the floor, but you're muted. Maybe it was an accidental hand raise, like a stretch, a zoom stretch. Can I ask another question about your, have you done any behavior studies? Um, so the German team is doing behavior studies and they've found a lot of interesting things. They um, essentially are testing um, spatial memory um, throughout, the, um, throughout the cycle. And they actually have found that um, during the winter, spatial memories decrease, that shrews do take longer to complete their mazes and throughout the different trials of the maze uh, to remember the maze structure during the winter. So it does look like there actually is some sort of reduced capability during the winter to um, for memory at least, um, which would correlate well with the changes in size of like, let's say the hippocampus. Um, and it also kind of makes sense a little bit too, just for the ecology of the shrew, because it is winter. And so the assumption is right now, at least that their home range is likely shrink because they aren't being as territorial for um, like mating processes. And so actually spatial memory might not be as important during the winter um, as it would be in the spring when they're mating. So yeah, there, it does seem like there is some sort of reduction in at least memory at this point. Um, and so that's if you do the training before the winter, do they still remember what they learned? after the winter? Oh, um, I do not remember what they have found for that result. I just know, I just know the comparisons between stages. I can't remember how long their memory lasts um, throughout it. So I had a real basic question. Yeah. So the shrinkage, is it actually the number of cells is being reduced or is size of cells are being reduced in this Morgan's that shrink? Um, so it's twofold. So one study was done by um, a master student in our collaborators lab that actually looks at the amount of neurons in there. And they do see a slight downgrade, I believe, in the amount of neurons. But the current hypothesis is that the shrinkage is actually the fat around the brain is being reduced rather than the cells and actually a little bit of the water content too is being absorbed. And it might just be based on the shrews having um, less water availability in the winter. 
And so that's another, I know I harped a lot on the lipid metabolism in this talk, but something else we're also looking at is trying to see things like aquaporins on whether or not these transmembrane proteins are being um, upregulated in the brain and just allowing for more water flow out of the brain too. Um, so not as heavy neurons as it is probably fat, but I mean, fat's important in the brain, right? For things like uh, myelination and stuff. So to say just fat is a little bit um, under, underselling it, I think. Thanks. Yeah. Alan, you have your hand raised? Yep. Um, I got a phone call and I'm sorry if I missed this. Yeah. You, you talked about doing experiments with the shrews and giving them an enzyme that would repress the effect of the genes. And I guess that would turn off the shrinkage, right? That's, that's yeah. Do yeah. You, do you do that in the lab or in the wild? And I'm so, just curious about how you control for things like the, the temperature variation that, that is also part of the, the puzzle. Yeah, yeah. So it's um, in the indoor um, indoor space where they're experiencing the natural temperature. So with that same um, experiment I showed earlier that was at least inducing Dan Health phenomenon. And then so you have a control group and an experimental group um, obviously the experimental getting the inhibitor and the control staying the same and then doing comparisons in the, uh, brain size. And then also relooking at the genetic data too, to see if there's some sort of similar shift that's happening between the two groups. Um, so, and then you can also, um, use a control of like my data that I have too, um, to like try and see if it, um, works well with it and stuff, but yeah. Okay, but I have to say that that experiment has been really difficult. Yeah. <laughs> um, like it's been really difficult because so at great cost, this at great cost in Germany, these exclosures were created. And the first year of the grant, even before the pandemic, like half the, half, half the experimental shrews just disappeared. Like they weren't found again. Right. And we lost our sample size because they are exclosures. So there's a control. You know, it, they're controlled, meaning, but they are outside, outdoors, so that they experience the temperatures and the daylight of the outdoors. So they, they have a little cage, but they're kind of outside. So they're outside and inside at the same time. The key point being that we had um, one year of data that had to go down the drain because of individual loss. And so we've learned a lot from those past experiments, and we're hoping that, that now we can get it right. Thanks. All right, any more questions for Bill? It's the exciting world of shrinking your brain and growing it back. Yeah. <laughs> We're excited about it. Is, is there any analog um, with any parts of the body growing and shrinking like in any other species or is this pretty unique? Um, so some of the collaborators um, found it in stoats, um, but to a much lesser extent. Um, and so actually some of the positive selection analyses I've done, I plan on redoing and including the stoat genome um, in the analyses. And then, so if you have two instances of it, you can actually look at parallel evolution. And instead of just having, because right, the 591 genes that I found could be involved with any, any of the processes that are adaptive in the shrew. And so by using the stoat, I hope to actually have um, two different instances so I can really narrow down which genes are being positively selected in both the individuals that share a common phenotype. So yeah, the stoat. And then I think that they, um, think that they might be finding it in hedgehogs again to a lesser extent but that's still preliminary data um so very unique um completely unique um still up in the air yeah any more questions or Question, comments, ideas about the shrews. Is no one curious about how we get to drug the shrews? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
it's a convoluted process yeah. involving what is it mealworms mealworms yeah injecting in, mealworms injecting a solution into mealworms and our, our latest iteration involves putting a food dye so that we can make sure that at least the solution made it into the mealworms yeah so the other thing is that they seem to be really so they really are hyperactive and they consume like constantly. So I think Bill, Bill spoke about it as well. So when when people, when we're trapping in the summer, we have to be out like at four in the morning because if you do not check the traps, uh, after two hours, the, sh the shrews can die inside because they haven't eaten inside the trap. So we have to go and um, get to the traps on time um, and feed them. Do they eat the same amount of food in winter and summer, or do they slow down a little bit in the winter? Um, so one of the early studies, um, probably done like 20 years ago, thinks that they eat roughly the same nutritional content in the um, winter as they do um, in the summer, that there's like some sort of slight shift in the types of insects that they're using, and that some of the more like nutritional um, insects have went down a little bit further underground. And so they might have to expend a little bit more energy getting to their like favorite meal essentially. And that's another one of the hypotheses on why shrinkage might actually be like beneficial is that if you're smaller under the snow or the subnivian layer, that it becomes easier for you to get to your prey of choice. Um, that's a little bit farther down instead of like squeezing as like a fat shrew. Um, so it's generally the same. There is a slight shift, but um, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Right. I this is a more common evolutionary adaptation. Do you think? I'm sorry. What was that? Why do you think it isn't more common? You said the shrew is one of the only creatures you know of that does this. Why? Uh, why isn't this more prevalent? Is it? Yeah. Um, so my guess at it is that, and again, this is a guess, um, is that the shrews have really been almost pigeonholed into this adaptation. Um, just due to their high metabolism, there's likely like very large constraints on them that don't allow, let's say, hibernation, right? Um, that they aren't able to process the amount of fats or make the amount of fats to hibernate. They're just because even some smaller organisms like like squirrels don't have this high of metabolism, but can enter hibernation. And so, yeah, I really think they're constrained by this high metabolism and their limited home ranges into figuring out a different way of, of transversing a winter environment and that I don't think every organism is pigeonholed into. That's, that's generally my guess, other than just also the molecular constraints too, right? Um, regrowing a brain isn't easy. Regrowing the fat in a brain isn't an easy process. I mean, even looking at human neurodegeneration, right? We actively try to regrow uh, degenerated brains and we can't even figure that out. And so just for evolution to somehow stumble upon it um, is very interesting. And I think that's, yeah, just why it's unique. Um, yeah. Yeah, very cool. I wonder if people are looking at those pathways, trying to figure out what's going on there. I'm sure they are. Um, that's going to be a hell of a rabbit hole and we go down later. Um, the yeah. next question was, do, are other things that have, are other small mammals that have high resting metabolic rates related to the shrew in any way? Like, do you, is there like a gradient of metabolism that kind of goes down or up? I'm trying to figure out like, this didn't come out of nowhere, right? Something was related yeah. involved in it. And like, what was that? And like, if there's, that was the case, are there more of this type of creatures out there, I guess, at some there, point? There's something that Bill didn't touch upon and it's the diversity, the, the, the diversity. And it's something that I actually asked him to kind of take out of his, of his <laughs> talk. And it's that this, this genus of shrew and this group of shrews is unusual in that in mammals in general, there's a lot more diversity when you get closer to the tropics and a lot less diversity when you get closer to the poles. And this particular group biogeographically is the opposite. 
it's cl closer to the poles in Siberia, you have more diversity, more species that are present. And so they have this, this biogeographic oddity um, is something that requires a physiological explanation, right? They must have some capacity to survive as a small animal, because large animals can survive the winter, but a small animal is a small non-migratory animal. There's got to be something that enables them to survive. Now, there are hints that there are other species of shrews um, that may be undergoing the same phenomenon. But for example, close relatives that are found in Spain, closely related species, they, there's really no indication. They really do not. This is not something that, uh, in the cases where it's been looked, uh, there's no, no clear evidence that it's sort of phylogenetically conserved. The entire genus does it. That is not the case at all. However, you know, there's a huge diversity of these shrews out there, like in Siberia, basically. And the samples aren't there to elucidate whether they really undergo this or they don't, right? This one happens to be like in Western Europe, where it's relatively easy to document, and it was discovered early on, right? And that's why they've become the system to look at. But they're nowhere near a model organism, as I, uh, as we, as Bill outlined. You know, they're really difficult to work with. They're difficult to trap, difficult to maintain. So even though we might think, oh, everyone can figure out this out, and in fact, one of the grant reviewers said, oh, you can figure this out in mice. It's not. It's the first time. This, this the work that Bill presented is the first time that anybody has been looked at looking at these molecular mechanisms. Yeah, that's very cool. Thank you so much. That was an excellent talk. Sorry if those questions were simple, I'm a chemist by trade, so like- Oh, no, no, they're great, thanks. Comfort zone. Really good job, though. Thanks. Yeah, all right, I'll stop jumping in, and I'm just saying goodbye. Yeah. I'm jumping in mostly because I was, because I said to Bill, oh, Bill, that's distracting. Yeah. <laughs> it turns out it came out in the questions. Thank you, Bill, so much. This was a okay. wonderful presentation. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye.